Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to episode one of Spacewalk. Now, we're about a week out from SpaceX's third full stack launch of Starship, and we have a lot of questions from you about how it went. So I figured now would be a perfect time to talk about Starship's third launch. Episode one of Spacewalk. Wow. Yeah, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. Uh, sorry if you hear stuff. Uh, this is, again, kind of the whole point of this whole podcast is it might not always sound great. Uh, I'm going to be walking around. Uh, today, I'm actually on my way home from Texas, finally, after the first or after the, I guess, the third Starship launch. Sorry. Uh, so I'm actually at the O'Hare Airport working my way back home to Iowa. So if you hear stuff, that is why. And yeah, again, this is, I guess, you know, I'm tucked away in a fairly quiet place right now. Um, it's just way too noisy when walking around. So today's spacewalk will not be a walk. It'll just be uh, while on the go. But we, again, uh, I'm recording this almost a week out from the third Starship full stack test. And man, oh man, did uh, there's just so much to talk about. It was, in some ways, it was so much better than I thought. I'm so glad to see so much progress in other ways, the failure of the upper stage and the lack of its ability to, you know, uh, properly maintain orientation is a pretty big bummer because that is not only necessary for reentry, but that is also necessary for any just normal mission. Any like even if this was not a reusable vehicle, being able to maintain attitude uh, once on orbit and the ability to relight engines is a big deal. So I really hope they get this figured out on the next one. Um, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but. Um, actually, yeah, we'll start with this one. This is a, um, uh, a question from Tommy McCormick over on Patreon. Again, uh, we will be grabbing some questions from you guys, um, supporters on Patreon, YouTube, and Twitter, or X. Uh, we'll read some of those. We also have some other questions that I, I pulled from just from Twitter as well. So, uh, And you can use hashtag Spacewalk Podcast, uh, and that will help us find questions and topics to talk about for the upcoming episode. So, um, so let's answer Tommy's question here. It says, if, as I think you speculated, the Starship's thruster collected ice and may have caused the slow roll and entering the atmosphere at the wrong angle, what would the solution be to this problem? Is this a new issue because SpaceX design or a known problem already solved on other spacecraft? Can they use heaters to prevent ice or will a different type of thruster be needed? Yeah, the, the thruster. So don't forget, they aren't really... Okay, so, so far there, there is some, some confusion and, and confusion on my part too. I know that there's that famous video, I guess, now of me, you know, uh, asking Elon Musk that question about the, you know, you're only going to use this on the booster, right? Uh, where I'm asking him about, you know, the hot gas thruster system. And I don't know if I'm wrong or if he's wrong or if we're all wrong or what. Um, but my understanding of a hot gas thruster is it has some kind of reaction, some kind of heated reaction, an exothermic reaction. And then it's not just, you know... Um, the, the reason I say this is the gas inside of the old tanks is still really cold. Yes, it might be hot when it comes, uh, you know, some of it is, is coming through the engine, through a heat exchanger and through the regen channels of the engine. And then the gas is pumped back into the main tanks of the, of the, of the Starship vehicle. So yeah, at some point it might be relatively hot, but in general, it's really cold. It's, it's close to cryogenic. And so when you're just venting a single gas like that, it's not having a reaction. And I think by definition, it's still a cold gas thruster. So I know there was talks about doing like a proper methalox hot gas thruster where they're actually combining methane and oxygen. We have not seen anything like that to date. Will we? I don't know. Is this the whole point? Like, did Elon just say hot gas thruster because it's hotter than a normal cold gas thruster <laughs> or like what, what I, I don't exactly know. I want to get more details on that. And that's kind of what I like about, I guess, this whole podcast thing is that um, I'm going to just be doing this kind of stuff where I'm telling you kind of where I'm at in my knowledge base. And I hope that in the future we can get some answers to this kind of stuff. So I think though, the idea is to not have to use any reaction thrusters, any reactive thrusters for RCS, you know, reaction control thrusters, ironically. I think the main idea, the whole point of these Olage thrusters and the Olage gas control system is that 
Starship is unique in the idea that the entire spacecraft, like two thirds of it, is full of oled gas. And as it stays in space, you actually have to vent that anyway. You're going to have boil off. You're going to have to release that gas. And every time you do that on a normal spacecraft, if you just vent it out of a single port, you actually have to correct for that. So say it has a, let's say you have a normal oxygen tank that's venting oxygen um, once it's in orbit. If you have it venting out, uh, you know, in a non-symmetrical way, just a single port, you would have to have RCS. If you're trying to maintain attitude, you'd have to have RCS react in the opposite action. So you're actually not only venting gas, but you're also wasting your reaction control. So the idea is if you can use your venting gas to control uh, in these moments, then it's free. It's essentially, fr you know, free energy in the sense that it was going to be wasted and expelled anyway. So how does that actually look? What's that actually look like? Well, what if you don't need to do a maneuver? You can vent them at the same time. You can have two vents open opposite each other and cancel each other out. You can also, you know, kind of store it up. There's, there's some wiggle room there in the total pressure of the OLED system. So, you know, Starship can likely handle anywhere from, you know, we'll say five, six, seven, eight bars. So you can, and, and by the way, those, uh, you know, a one, one bar in chamber pressure uh, in, in the ullage pressure on a tank that big is a lot of pressure. So that's actually a lot of potential energy. If you even have it raised just a tiny bit, you can store it up for a little bit, um, but obviously you have to keep it within a safe realm. So it is an interesting thing. It's a really interesting control scheme. And I'm really curious how this will work out for the next one. What fixes they can make? My speculation is that it seems like either they didn't have enough control thrusters or like one was either stuck open or stuck closed or something was happening that was just making it so as it was trying to correct and orient itself, it just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't accurate. It was not working as intended. So uh, that's my current speculation, which then means it was not able to reenter in the correct attitude. It was not able to reenter, you know, in a stable orientation with the heat shield facing reentry. It was still tumbling as it was coming back into re-entry. And it was going to be re-entry no matter what. This is also why it didn't relight the engines. So as you likely know, you know, they were hoping to do a Raptor engine relight test on, on flight three. They did not, probably because it was tumbling out of control and they couldn't settle the, the tanks. So, you know, the question is, will they figure this out? My assumption is, of course they will. Will they have to make changes? Maybe. Is it something they can do with software? I don't know. Is it something they have to add additional hardware, heaters or whatever? I don't know. Is Are they going to have to totally change and do like, you know, do a typical du dual prop, you know, like hydrazine system? I don't know. That's uh, where we're at. I wouldn't be surprised if they fly this exact same thing again, maybe add a few more ports. I had you know, that's something they can kind of do relatively easy with Starship is just kind of weld in new ports. You know, it's not like other vehicles where it's, you know, it's like, well, we did, we built it. It's totally done. This is like, well, we built it. It's still a canvas for future expansion and future changes. And that's half the beauty of using stainless steel and half the beauty of this entire iterative program is it's not necessarily a huge deal for them to just, eh, you know, we'll tack on some new thrusters. You know, we've seen them literally just weld in like new CO, a different set of COPV tanks and, and change out different systems on the fly, especially like Starhopper and the SN days. You saw that happening all the time. We hope to see that less and less as this vehicle gets closer and closer uh, to being, you know, actually operational, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it does change. And um, how big and small, if it's noticeable, we have yet to find out. And hopefully we find out soon. But this is, uh, on on that topic, um, AJ uh, uh, Tonkick, or sorry, at A-J-T-O-N-C-E-K on Twitter asks, uh, do you think Starship could make it safely to the ground if it loses a few heat shield tiles? Could it theor theoretically reflown? So on that note, assuming it re-enters heat shield, you know, has proper orientation through re-entry and it's, and it's heat shield is facing the correct way and the flaps are working and it maintains orientation. I 100% suspect Starship can fly and make it to the ground safely, missing a handful of heat shield tiles. The reason I say that is because we saw not only the space shuttle do that exact thing, also the Buran shuttle uh, do the exact same thing with many missing heat shield tiles. 
And the important note here is their heat shield system uh, was protecting the, uh, the aluminum chassis of that vehicle. Uh, so the fuselage of the shuttle and of Buran were aluminum alloys. Starship is stainless steel, which just in general has a lot higher melting point. Um, you know, another big weakness of the shuttle was, you know, those leading edges of the shuttle um, were reinforced carbon carbon. And when uh, it had a foam strike during uh, Columbia, unfortunately, it just poked a huge hole in the actual wing. With Starship, um, even if heat shield tiles are falling off and hitting, you know, the, the lower flaps, like we kind of saw, I think, actually in our high speed footage um, from our team down at Starbase, when you see Cosmic Perspectives footage with, with Ryan shooting uh, on the tracking telescope that we have, which I'm assuming hopefully you've seen that footage by now, it's, it's outstanding. You can see the vehicle going through Max-Q and you can see heat shield tiles falling off and hitting the grid fence and stuff. And it's, it's spectacular. Now, if a heat shield tile falls off of Starship and hits one of those, you know, the lower flaps, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it, yes, might destroy another heat shield or two or three or four, but the underlying structure there is stainless steel, as opposed to the shuttle when it had foam strikes, literally could punch holes in the actual leading edge of the wing. And importantly, the other note is that that is not actually the leading edge of Starship. Um, you know, it more or less comes in belly first. Now you don't necessarily want to have exposed stainless steel on the top of those, you know, on the upper edges of those flaps, but I just don't think it's as big of a deal on Starship as it would have been on the Space Shuttle or Buran or some other similar vehicle. And again, we have seen stainless steel, um, stainless steel things re-enter from orbit um, in one piece, such as the Centaur upper stage has actually made it to the ground as, as a single, uh, single piece before with zero heat shielding and very thin stainless steel. So do I think that it could have safely made it to the ground if it loses a few tiles 100%? Um, and I'm sure we'll see that. I'm positive we will see um, Starships come back from orbit missing a handful of tiles. Now, I do have to say Flight 3 had way fewer missing tiles than Flight 2, um, but I would like to still see improvement on that. I would like to see, you know, maybe only a few missing, like a small handful, two, three, four, five, um, and not 20 or 30. I don't really know the number yet, but it definitely seems to be a, a massive improvement from Flight 2. And, you know... I assume it can only get better from here. So, um, but that being said, I do think it doesn't suffer as much of a fate, uh, a, a bad fate if it is missing. Um, you know, and again, space shuttle landed with missing tiles. Um, same with Buran. So, yeah, it's uh, so on that note, I guess here's another uh, Patreon um, question from Brantley O'Day asking, How do you feel seeing Starship's failures knowing you will one day fly aboard? Now, this is a pretty common question, and it's a uh, I guess a completely understandable question. Um, I have, I have personally segregated the differences in my head between this test vehicle and my eventual ride, um, with dear moon on starship. You know, this is, we're not used to seeing this. We are not used to seeing the iterative design process truly played out in front of our eyes. A lot of the stuff would typically happen behind closed doors where a company or a program is trying something over and over and just blowing stuff up and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, SpaceX is very public about this. They talk about it all the time. Um, we've seen these vehicles go from the most simple rudimentary star hopper, um, you know, just little tiny hoppery can with a, with a Raptor engine stuck on, you know, a water tower with a Raptor engine stuck to it, um, to a lot more advanced rocket now with 33 of the world's most advanced engines running simultaneously, flawlessly through ascent. You know, I, it's in my head, we're just not even anywhere close yet to the actual vehicle. Um, we will see a lot of progress. We need to see a lot of progress for us to fly. And that's where I'm looking at milestones. I'm not looking at these individual flights as like, oh no, or oh good, or oh bad, oh, or that's going to be me or anything. None of that because it's just completely different. Um, and, and, you know, in fact, you have to keep in mind that our mission requires orbital refueling. We can't, Starship cannot get to the moon and back um, without completely refueling, um, or at least partially refueling, mostly refueling in low Earth orbit. So we will have to see that demonstrated, which also means they have to have a rapid flight cadence. Starship will have flown dozens, if not several dozens, 50, 60, 70, 80 flights before um, we fly on it. So, you know, we'll, we expect to see Starship launches. We expect to see 
Um, refueling launches, we expect to see a human landing system. We expect to see other human flights before ours, including Jared Isaacman's for Polaris 3. There's a lot that we should see happen before, uh, before Dear Moon. And again, trying to predict when that happens, I have no idea. I'm just looking at milestones. The next milestone I want to see is getting to orbit. The next milestone I want to see after that is deploying payloads. The next milestone, actually, no, here, I'll go in order. The next milestone I want to see is this exact flight profile reflown and reflown perfectly, where the Raptor engine relights, the payload door operates perfectly fine, but there's some questions on whether or not it cycled properly. Um, I want to see re-entry, and I want to see it belly flop in one piece. I also want to see the booster um, relighting its engines on the next go, which I think is mostly a, a, a relatively easy software fix, um, flight control. It's kind of a, a PIDS issue, which would be, um, you know, kind of how quickly it, uh, uh, the proportional integral derivative is what PID st stands for, a PID device. Basically, how how much it's reacting to things and the speed of those uh, of those grid fins, how are they controlling? I'm sure now they have a lot more data on it and going, oh, these overreacted or these underreacted or whatever. And hopefully they'll get a really good handle on that in relatively no time. I expect by the next launch, the booster should maintain proper control, not have sloshing in its in its tanks or whatever happened to actually cause the Raptors to not relight. It's a lot easier for the booster to relight because it is slowing down and it is decelerating. So therefore the, the liquid should be at the bottom of the tanks should be a lot easier to relight an engine in those circumstances. So I expect to see that. And then I expect to see a full orbital attempt. And then I expect to see, you know, um, I expect to see Starlinks deployed. Then I expect to see just a lot more milestones like that. I expect to start seeing refueling, a tanker put up and things preparing for the human landing system. Once the human landing system is launched, then it's really game on. Then I will be thinking, wow, they have life support. They have refueling. They obviously have like orbital and reuse figured out and, you know, re at least recoverability of, of the booster, all these big, huge milestones they will have figured out by the time human landing system goes. So for me, when human landing system launches for NASA, um, that will be the big, big milestone. And that's when I will start, you know, thinking about Dear Moon more and really will likely be preparing around that same time too. I have, you know, no idea what our training schedules and stuff will look like. But, you know, that's kind of the big, big, big milestone for me. Um, we'll end with one more question. This is from our Discord, which is, you know, available through Patreon from Nathan or N. Moling in Discord, uh, asking what parts of the Starship design do you think are working better than ex expected? Examples, belly flop and hot staging. I would definitely say hot staging. I am shocked that they're two for two on hot staging. Now, at least as far as the upper stage, <laughs> you know, for the hot staging events, the boosters fared way better than I thought it would have for both of them. You know, the first one, at least it maintained, you know, main, stayed intact. The second one, it really had a clean boost back burn. But the both times the Starship upper stage looked like it was clean running right from the get-go. No big deal. And that's really impressive to me. So I would definitely say that the hot staging has gone from, and it's not that crazy. Again, we've done this before. The Soviets, you know, did it all throughout Soyuz and Proton and uh, the United States did it with the Titan II rocket. Like it's, it's not that crazy of a thing, but at this scale, it just feels different. It just feels like, holy crap. And with reusable rockets, you just don't think about lighting an engine on top of the other rocket while it's, you know, <laughs> while they're attached. Like it's just, it is wild. It is crazy. And, you know, that's, uh, that's something that I've been really impressed with. Um, otherwise, I think the other thing that's going better than I expected, the fact that the last two flights have had 33 Raptor engines running the entire ascent on Starship on the Super Heavy Booster is amazing. And then especially on this last launch, seeing clean shutdown of all six Raptor engines um, and even the shutdown at, at, for the boost back burn on, on Super Heavy. I mean, Raptor's impressive. Raptor went from, mm, this is a cool engine to, okay, this is a legitimate engine. This is a real engine capable of real work capable of doing real missions capable of absolutely nutty numbers so i'd say yeah the raptor engine and the hot staging are the two things that have so far for the starship program been going better than i expected so you know maybe next week we can talk more about or whenever we do the next one i don't know we're not necessarily scheduling these every week just kind of the idea is just to pop in and make an episode. So maybe for the next one, if you guys want to hear what things I don't think are going as well as expected, you know, maybe we'll save that for the next one. 
because I feel like we kind of touched on a handful of those. Uh, we'll save it for the next launch. Um, maybe in the next um, episode, we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. That's the the beauty of this podcast. So be sure and um, you know leave your ideas or questions by using hashtag spacewalk podcast, all one word, um, wherever you can even tag me like on Instagram at something and I might be able to find it there, you know? So if you see a story topic or something, just use the hashtag spacewalk podcast. We'll look for it. But of course, if you are a supporter, be sure and look for the link. We will be pulling, you know, kind of priority questions from our supporters as a thank you. So if you want to join the best way is Patreon, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And uh, yeah, and you know, the other thing with these podcasts, since this is a new podcast, especially the biggest way you guys can help is, uh, is simply to leave a review, give it a, a star, a thumbs up or a five star review or whatever you think, if you want to hear more of this, and that will help, you know, Apple and Spotify and all these, whatever, wherever you're listening, if you can just leave a review, that makes a huge difference and will help us, you know, right now, if you search spacewalk on anything, like you won't even hardly find it because it's hidden behind you know, all these like other dead podcasts or podcasts that talk or mention spacewalk. Um, so if we want to get um, easier, you know, help other people find this a lot easier, leaving a review would be a huge help. But that's it for episode one of Spacewalk with me, Tim Dodd. Um, thank you so much for listening. I hope this is, you guys have been asking for something like this, just a more casual format. This is about as casual as I can even imagine. And hopefully it's just something nice and easy that we can produce with very little effort and throw up and and just get out there for you guys more frequently than, you know, our fancy, fancy production of all of our other videos. Um, so yeah, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Hope you join me on my next spacewalk. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.